Good evening and welcome to the show with wittier, cleverer and more glamorous guests than last week. <laughs> In the news this week, following his heart bypass operation, doctors fear Boris Yeltsin may have misinterpreted instructions to go on a liquid-only diet. <laughs> In the main square in Managua, the world's lamest military coup is swiftly put down. <laughs> and in West London, a scantily clad Barbara Cartland leans out of a hotel window. <laughs> On uh, Ian Hislop's team, a comedian who boasts the unusual achievement of winning the Actors' Union Tennis Championship, although he was taken to a tie-break in the fourth set by Dane Sora Heard, a Tony Hawks. <laughs> And with Paul Merton tonight is a journalist and election pundit, so at the end of each round we can look forward to two hours of analysis on what the result would mean if applied to the rest of the country. Vincent Hanna. Well, what better way to start than round one? Answers on a postcard, but in the meantime, here's our film round, Paul and Vincent. That's Bobby Charlton. <laughs> New sex cubicles, thank you. Yeah. I never saw that baby before in my life. <laughs> and this is what Peter Snow wants for Christmas. <laughs> Bill Clinton comes out, I never liked women anyway. <laughs> American election, uh, Bill Clinton's won. Did really? you predict that, Vincent? Yeah. Or did you think it was going to be Kinnock? <laughs> well, I felt a bit sorry for Dolo, because but he did put his whole campaign was based on the fact that, you know, I'm not too old to do this job. <laughs> And I don't know whether you saw his, his, his accepting defeat speech. It was extraordinary. He just started off, said something like, uh, I came down the stairs uh, this evening and I thought to myself, uh, and, and then he stopped. And then he went, I came down in the elevator this evening. <laughs> and this is the one thing old people do is worry about unnecessary details. We don't care how you got there. We want to know what you've got to say. Do you remember B uh, Bob Dole's particular gaffe that he made in the election campaign? Only that he fell over we have uh, footage of this. <laughs> Same thought he should have had a stair lift. <laughs> the gas that I was thinking of that was that when he said that cigarettes were not addictive. Ah. He said it was no more dangerous than drinking milk, apparently. <laughs> That's high tar milk, obviously. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is. It's Bill Clinton's re-election and the uh, greatest de Democrat victory since the war. Uh, friends shook him by the hand, his wife uh, threw her arms around him, and his teenage daughter went... Mm. <laughs> Ian and Tony, you're watching the BBC. It's a large erection. Uh, presumably not his. Uh, it must be his, the way he's moving. Uh, <laughs> this is 60 years of the BBC. Fireworks. Yep, fireworks. Well spotted, Ian. No. Um, <laughs> Very little gets past I, me, I yeah. tell you. <laughs> you probably fund the whole world service for two of those fireworks. You're not... Yes. Um, <laughs> up they go, wow! Let's make another 10,000 people redundant. Wow! <laughs> Jolly good, Mr. DG. Uh, somebody told me once you mentioned the world service, somebody told me once they heard a newsreader in one of the sort of, uh, you know, perhaps one of the uh, foreigners sort of reading the, you know, the English news said, um, the time is 10 o'clock Greenwich. Meantime, here is the news. <laughs> I think there's a big argument about it as well, because all the awards were won by very recent programmes. It was 60 years, and they were all won in the last two years. I think the best current affairs was won by that day's news. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> uh, there's a yeah. conspiracy theory that, that, that it's just the BBC patting itself on the back saying how magnificent all our re current programmes are. So it was a bit odd. I mean, the best presenter yeah. ever in the history of the BBC. Mm. Not David Attenborough, not Richard Dimbleby, but the mm. man who does the sport. <laughs> I think everyone likes Des Lyman. I, think, I, I, think I like him, but it's yeah. this word best. Is it true that the Doctor Who fan clubs all phoned in and sent letters in and voted so that... What, for Des Lynham? <laughs> He's going to be the new Doctor Who. He's the spring double, Doctor Who. <laughs> Very professional sort of Doctor Who. Well, well, this could be the end of the world as we know it, but first the football results. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, the, the BBC also uh, were in the news this week for something else, for publishing something. 250 things you've promised to do, or they promised to do in your behalf, or Mr. Burt has promised to do in your behalf. For example, it says they will install talking lifts everywhere. But what's the lift going to say? It's good to say, I, I am, am a lift. lift. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to say, Bob Dole, you are in a lift. <laughs> <laughs> These are not stairs. <laughs> Don't take this the wrong way, but we'll be going down in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is the celebration of 60 years of the BBC, marked by a star-studded award ceremony. Uh, Britain's leading politicians were asked to nominate their favourite television moment for the last, uh, from the last 60 years. Tony Blair chose the 1966 World Cup final, Paddy Ashdown chose Nelson Mandela's release, and John Major chose the Ron Seal quick-drying varnish ad. <laughs> Paul and Vincent. Well, this is uh, Fiona Campbell with two Fs. Supposed um, to walk around the world. Yeah, she was going to get into the Guinness Book of Records for smoking a joint all over the world. And <laughs> she got lifts uh, in lorries, and she says that she um, shagged the van. Oh, here's the other one coming. Look behind you. <laughs> with a bed on the top of the van too. <laughs> that poor woman is to be pitied and not criticised. Why? She was stalked for several weeks by Janet Street Porter and a film crew. <laughs> it is a well-known fact that people who get that treatment invariably turn to recreational drugs and, sh and shag van drivers. How, how are we spelling Fiona? Two Fs. Yeah. Well, I presume she had a few more along the way. Yeah. <laughs> she got, got pregnant by a backup driver. He, <laughs> he must have just misunderstood what backup <laughs> Yeah, she, she claimed she did it all to sort of, you know, win the favour of her father. Really, it was an absurd thing to do. You could just nip down the road and get yeah. a packet of fags. Exactly. <laughs> it is uh, Fiona Campbell, uh, the round-the-world walker, who has admitted this week uh, that due to a number of lifts she was given in America, she didn't walk 19,586 miles at all, uh, but a mere 18,586 miles. Uh, Fiona Campbell has already published two books about her trip: a Walk Around the World and Feet of Clay. People began to suspect that Fiona uh, may have cheated when she announced plans for her third book, A Motoring Guide to Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and finally, Ian and Tony. I don't know who that is. Oh, that's Fergie. That's, well, that looks a bit more like her. Well, this must be a story about Fergie, presumably. Well spotted. Yeah, well done. Well, it, it's, uh, she's, um, she's admitted she cheated. For years, everybody thought she was a member of the royal family. She wasn't. <laughs> She's a completely bonkers slapper. <laughs> so I, it's, it's another one of these public confessions. It's exactly like the Fiona story. You sort of, you make a tremendous balls up of it, and then you come out and print a book saying, I made a terrific balls up of it. Please give me some more money and airtime. And the, what were the other revelations in her, in her book? Well, the, she kept on saying how much she loved her husband at every stage. She said he was terribly good about the way he reacted to the toe-sucking incident, which wasn't a toe-sucking incident at all, actually. She said that her and Johnny Bryan were playing Cinderella. So <laughs> <laughs> you've never seen that in the panto version of the night. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is, it is Fergie, or uh, the Curse of Hello Readers, as she's now known, uh, whose book My Story is being serialised in Hello magazine. Uh, Fergie's book describes how she first met Prince Andrew. He seemed like a very charming, gentle giant who had sprung magically from the woodwork. <laughs> now a lamp shone in my forest. <laughs> sort of uh, intimate detail you can really do without, isn't it? <laughs> With which echoes of hello, we bid goodbye to our first round, and the position is that uh, an early lead has been established by both teams, each one ahead with four. Uh, with the excitement of round two, rather unlikely, let's opt instead for the guaranteed absurdity that is our caption competition. Ian and Tony have this to contemplate. <laughs> Paul and Vincent, consider this. Uh, and we look forward to a variety of implausible explanations by the end of the programme. Uh, round two, for want of a better venue, takes place in the grimy hellhole that is our gutter press. Two examples of tabloidal understatement, uh, Ian and Tony. 
What's this about? Tony's new Blair do. Basically, I think it was the Financial Times. Was that right? Ran a story saying that he, he they reckon that he'd had a new hairdo because he wasn't popular enough with the women, and Clinton had won it, or nearly won when they printed this because he was popular with the women. And uh, Tony Blair said that he was going slightly bald. Uh, that, that's why he changed it. But he's actually not going slightly bald. He is slightly bald. He's going bald. <laughs> Well, it, he had this bouffant hairstyle and it was getting a bit wild. There were a few sort of windy shots of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you had and to do Tony that doesn't mind. like it. There was any way you could do that, wasn't it? Mm. Yes, no, there was a Murray Fell that maintained that uh, he had a greater satisfaction rating uh, with men than with women, Tony Blair. Women uh, find John Major sexier than Tony Blair. They must be lying. <laughs> a blue bottle is not an elephant because it's bigger than a fly. <laughs> it's Eric Cantona. <laughs> it's a bit ridiculous to think that women are just going to vote simply because of the way somebody's hair is, though. Isn't that a bit ridiculous? Um, I mean, yeah. there were people saying in Nazi Germany, I love what he does with his hair. <laughs> <laughs> and that moustache, honestly. A lot of people wouldn't get away with it, but you. <laughs> well, polls show that, in fact, John Major is increasingly seen as the more attractive leader ever since the government abolished free eye tests. <laughs> uh, Paul and Vincent uh, make sense of this. TV love stunt triggers trial. Well, this is, a, this is about a chat show in New York called the Jenny Jones Show. And it's one of these victim television things where they bring people on and surprise, surprise them. Like here, only this time they brought on this man and said, we've got somebody who fancies you, who lives close to you. And he thought it was Donna, his next door attractive neighbor. Anyway, they brought on a man who immediately embraced him on the set. This man was called Schmitz, that's the victim. He was so upset about this that he went and bought a shotgun and killed his admirer two days later. <laughs> funny how this always gets a laugh. <laughs> the funny story is that they called Jenny Jones, the chat show host, or compare, as we would tend to call him, hmm. as a witness. They allege it's her fault. They say that she humiliated him and drove him to the point where he flipped hmm. and took a gun and shot this gay admirer. But she, being Jenny Jones, claims that she has nothing to do with the Jenny Jones show. Nothing at all. <laughs> nothing at all. No. But she's only hosting it because of the coincidence of the title and her name being... <laughs> very, very reasonable defence, yeah. yes. Not very well informed on this particular item. Well, I did it on Radio 4 last week. Oh, right. That's you shot someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, self-defence. Do you, know, do you remember how he actually described uh, Jonathan Schmitz? He, uh, yes, he started talking about uh, something about you know, he admired his young, firm body and all that yeah. kind of thing. It was all very, mm. very sexual. A cute little body, the cute sort you body. want to dust off from time to time. Mm. <laughs> Never do it with a vacuum cleaner, that's very dangerous. <laughs> uh, before the stunt, apparently, the producer of the show told Jenny Jones, I think Jonathan is going to die when he sees it's Scott. <laughs> Almost right. <laughs> Which Jolly Japes from the wacky world of homicide signal the end of this middling round. And at the moment, uh, both teams are still forging ahead. Ian and Tony and Paul and Vincent all currently winning with six. <laughs> uh, round three is how we traditionally bridge the embarrassing gap that would otherwise exist between rounds two and four. Odd one out is what it's come to be known as for reasons too obvious to explain. Paul, your international heavyweights mm -hmm. are the Pope, George Bush, Fidel Castro, and Yuri Geller. Uh, the Pope, um, he's the only one who drinks his bedtime cocoa in a surreptitious manner. <laughs> <laughs> when they were 19, each one of them individually went to a fancy dress party as Dracula. They all did that. Mm -hmm. They've all got a roof garden. <laughs> and the only other thing I can think of is that uh, Castro's the odd one out. Is the right answer, <laughs> or, uh, or at least it's the right odd one out. But w the CIA, uh, CIA. Mm. Geller, what? Dewey Geller claimed I've worked for the CIA. You know, um, George Bush clearly did because he was the, he was Mr. CIA for a while, and um, I believe the Pope did a bit of uh, undercover work. <laughs> <laughs> the long robes didn't get away with anything. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's what he's doing at the moment. Yeah. Yuri um, Geller seems to have actually bent 
Fidel Castro's microphone there as well. <laughs> well, they tried to blow up Castro's beard. There was a frogman got in as far as a sideburn before he was discovered. <laughs> but they did actually send a frogman, strange you should mention it. No, that's um, why I mentioned it. Yes, <laughs> to Cuba to, um, to make out that he was Jesus Christ. Surely the flippers would have given it away. <laughs> Uh, in the 1970s, the CIA attempted to assassinate Fidel Castro using exploding cigars. Castro has since given up smoking, and the CIA are within a few months of perfecting the self-detonating Nicorette patch. <laughs> um, Vincent, your uh, unsavoury bunch are John Burt, a Liverpool FC, Mr Robert Walker of Bradford, and a Roman dustman. That dustman's slightly overfishes. He's got rid of half of that building, look. <laughs> this man Walker in the frock coat is a sort of foppish character who says that if he dresses like that, then children will fall down in front of him and obey him when he gives them instructions. That's very good, yes. Very impressive. And exactly the same thing with John Burt. If he dresses up in a nice suit, people fall down in front of him and obey him. Yeah. Um, which brings me to Liverpool FC, looking like Pratt's at Wembley. Football. Uh, these are all... You know. <laughs> anyway, Liverpool suits were by Armani, looking like ice cream salesman there, and yep. John Burt fancies Armani suits, and your man from Bradford, something about Armani about him, I read something where he had... It his spectacles were by Armani, I think. But the dustman, this is the funny part of the story, the dustman, the, the city government in Rome <laughs> wanted their dustman to look smart for the millennium, so they went round all the couturiers and said, could you dress up our dustman? And they said, piss off, we're too busy making suits for John Burt and the Liverpool football team. <laughs> we're too busy clearing up after Godzilla. Look at a chunk he's taken out of our building. <laughs> yes, that's a pretty good answer. It is a pretty good answer. It is a very yeah. good answer, insofar as it's right, I suppose. Uh, several top designers recently modelled their own uh, dustman outfits, although there was some confusion when Vivian Westwood turned up in a ripped PVC smock and was thrown on the back of a dust cart. <laughs> In his McTaggart lecture this year, John Burt praised this programme. Uh, Have I Got News For You has carried forward an ancient national tradition of puncturing the powerful and pompous, said the puffed up little twat. <laughs> <laughs> Strange way to hand in your resignation. <laughs> uh, Tony, your uh, aristocratic knobs are uh, James Hewitt, P.G. Woodhouse, General Alcy Biodies and Guy Fawkes. Right. I think this is a treason question. Yeah, I think it's treason because uh, Guy Fawkes obviously got involved in a bit of treason, mm. did a bit of blowing up and stuff. Uh, yes. Got stopped. Got, he got stopped, didn't he? Yeah. But uh, that's why we have those lovely fireworks. You love them. You're don't? right. <laughs> They're awfully good, yeah. aren't they? You go out. And you go out and you go and you go. Look, children, fireworks. I fireworks. recognise them. <laughs> Boom. Yes. <laughs> We do this to celebrate a disemboweled Catholic who we then burnt. <laughs> yeah. Much better than that American Halloween. Yes. <laughs> right, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, uh, he, he was sort of involved in treason. During the war uh, in France, he made some broadcasts which were perceived to be kind of anti-British or something, or pro-Nazi or something. We weren't actually fighting France, but... Uh, no, no, but he was, he was in France fighting them on his no. own. Well, he was... Uh, <laughs> but James Hewitt, he... Uh, is, it's a treasonable offence to, to sleep with uh, uh, Princess Diana. Um, I'm not going to say any more. Uh, General Alcibiades, or whatever his name is, he was an Athenian. He was an Athenian and he went and joined the, the Spartans or something like that. But I think the odd one out... <laughs> Guy Fawkes is the odd one out because he was the only one that was properly punished for it. Is the wrong answer. <laughs> um, well, P.G. Woodhouse is the only one who's won a dog's head at a darts competition. <laughs> <laughs> P.G. Woodhouse is the yeah. odd one out because he didn't do anything. Mm. He was acquitted. He was found not guilty. He, he didn't he was commit a treasonable mm. uh, offence. Malcolm Muggridge went and spoke to him for several days and said he's a silly old fool, but he didn't do anything. So yeah, P.G. Woodhouse is the odd one out. Is the right answer. Uh, Guy Fawkes, of course, was not only accused of treason, but found guilty, whereupon he was put on the rack and then hanged until he was almost dead, after which his guts and testicles were removed and burnt in front of him. His head was struck off and his body cut into four pieces. Mind you, he never tried it again. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, in this round, Ian... Edward Heath, Dennis Healy, <laughs> Reverend Moon, 
and Keith Moon. Is, that, is Edward Heath the only one who checks the obituary column to see if he's in it or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh look, I died. Oh, I might as well get up then. <laughs> it, it, this is to do with Moonies. Um, because the Reverend Moon is a Moonie. Uh, <laughs> no, it's true, the name's a giveaway. Um, and he organises conferences. And there was a scandal recently when Edward Heath went to a Mooney conference. I suppose Healy must have gone to one of these Mooney conferences as well. Because Keith Moon can't, because he's dead. That's your bit of pop knowledge that you're displaying, mm. obviously. He was a drummer. Mm. For mm. a popular beat combo that you're aware of? <laughs> that is the right answer. It Keith is. Moon is the odd one out, is the right Hooray! answer. Hooray! It is. Oh. According to one biography, Keith Moon once arranged eight naked prostitutes in a row and got each one to sing out a different note when he blew on their buttocks. He was never asked to play at the Royal Festival Hall again. <laughs> All of which uh, brings How us... How would you tune them? <laughs> All of which brings us romping to the end of this round and the compromising position is that uh, Ian and Tony have a slightly sticky nine whilst Paul and Vincent have a well-oiled eleven. And so, to the uh, familiar and reliable disappointment of our final missing words round, a random cross-section of the week's headlines, including, or intriguingly not, some or less from this week's universally acclaimed guest publication, The Slasher, <laughs> the official newspaper of the Forestry Commission. So, on we go with jobless, try what? Burglary. <laughs> Working. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, escort agency is the right answer. Uh, next, what jacko to be what after sex in the what? Wacko, blacko, sacko. <laughs> no, he's just going through the Marx Brothers now. <laughs> wacko, jacko to be father after sex in the clinic. Uh, no, uh, Ian was actually got uh, two out of three. Oh. Wacko, blacko, test tubo. <laughs> Vimto. Uh, nothing to do with Vimto. <laughs> Wacko, daddio. Dadzo. Daddio. Daddio, yes, I'll ah. give you that. Wacko, jacko to be daddo, in fact, after ah. sex in the sacco. You didn't have sex. Uh, yes, with his former nurse, Debbie yeah, Rose, who is pregnant with a little boy, or, or boyo, presumably. <laughs> uh, next, Prince Charles donates what? Is it brain to Euro Disney? <laughs> Going to turn it into a ride. Yes, we quite to, um, to fit all that in. Prince Charles cars, and you hang on to the ears, and you go. <laughs> it is from the slasher. Fur tree. Beach. Fur. Uh, oak. Go, oak is the right answer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yes, the uh, royal thumbs up were Who given. Who gets the point for that? The uh, person who said oak, oak. I would get. Yeah. <laughs> person said oak, all right. <laughs> Uh, and it's on a knife edge now. Um, yes, a scheme to that restore Blake Lincoln. That shotgun had a good idea. <laughs> you have to have a hug first. Oh, right. Oh, yes. right forget it. Yeah. And he has to admire your cute yeah. little body. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> Don't tempt you to do what? <laughs> Next, scouts outraged by rector's what? Woggle. Woggle? Is it a uh, bum? Bum? Uh, it's not rector's bum, no. <laughs> Isn't this the bloke who painted it blue and shoved it over the organ loft? <laughs> organ is the word. And invited people to chuck fruitly bits up in there. Um, <laughs> Bible. Bible. No. A lascivious book. Novel. Novel is the Novel. right answer. Very good. Uh, entitled Murder Within Tent. Uh, <laughs> and finally, what market branches out? Branch. <laughs> Forest. Tree. Oak. No. Um, I can see Vimto. Your thought for us. <laughs> Vimto market branches out. You know uh, Vimto, Vimto's on a gram of vomit? <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> You'd think they would have spotted that at some point, <laughs> wouldn't you? Bimto. <laughs> Branch was closer, I yeah. have to say. Tree, tree, tree twig, smaller. Twig. Bark twig. market. Uh, They're making uh, suits out of bark Petal. and selling them to you. Leaf. <laughs> Leaf. <laughs> twig. Uh, no, twig. I'll give you the answer. Stick is in fact I said stick. twig. Yes, yeah, you oh, did, right. but... Uh, Moral winner there. Unfortunately, the answer is stick and not twig, otherwise oh, I would have right. it. Um, yes, this is in yeah. Slash's regional roundup, so you may have missed it. Um, <laughs> all of which uh, hysterical ramblings mean we've reached the final frontier of tonight's show as we know it. And the situation is that this week's Bob Dolls are Paul and Vincent with 13, while this week's Barbie Dolls are Ian and Tony with 15. Uh, before we uh, quite literally disappear, a uh, brief and uh, unwanted return to our caption competition. Ian and Tony, what do you think of this? I said blow the tyres up, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, passers-by notices that bros aren't looking as good as they used to. <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell brothers deny father's influence. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Paul and Vincent, this is yours. Car stereos nicked from faces of five men. <laughs> <laughs> New teachers arrive at the riding school. <laughs> I said I'd be wearing this. <laughs> Oh, and I'll catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> On which uh, perfectly plausible note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hisloff and Tony Hawkes, Paul Merton and Vincent Hanna. And I leave you with news that after discipline problems at yet another school in Yorkshire, Gillian Shepherd goes to talk to the headmaster personally. <laughs> in the skies over Farnborough, there's no doubting the success of the latest stealth bomber. And the inventor of car safety airbags tells the press where she got the idea from. <laughs> Good night.